para que conozcan un equipo que adquirimos recientemente en, en PAM, en el Instituto de Investigaciones en Microbiología y Parasitología Médica, gracias al financiamiento del CONICET y de la Agencia Nacional de, la Promoción, de Promoción de la Investigación, el Desarrollo Tecnológico y la Innovación. La primera parte de esta presentación va a tratar sobre el funcionamiento y las distintas eh, aplicaciones para el estudio de las nanopartículas que ofrece este equipo, que se llama ZView. Y en la segunda parte les vamos a brindar información eh, sobre los procedimientos que se realizan para medir una muestra, los archivos que se generan en cada medición y cómo van a poder hacer ustedes para enviarnos eh, sus muestras para analizar. So let's start, Cristina. I would like to introduce you all to Cristina Klassen. She is the international sales manager from Particle Matrix, and she was the person uh, in charge of uh, dealing with all the eccentricities required to sell an equipment to Argentinian researchers in 2023. So thanks, Cristina, for, for doing this. And whenever you want, you can, you can start the, the presentation. Perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for joining, actually. So welcome, of course, from my side. Um, I'm really impressed how much interest um, there is in, in the Zeta view. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to show you now some slides explaining how the system is working and what can be done with it. Um, and afterwards, we will have some time for questions. Um, so ask me whatever you want. <laughs> um, now I'm trying to share my screen. So I hope that you can see my screen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Because I can't see you now anymore. So if there's something coming up, you need to let me know. I can't see anything now anymore because it's on presentation mode. Okay, let's get started. So I gave the presentation the title Multifluorescent NTA, um, Next Generation EV Characterization with Particle Metrics Zeta View. And I'm going to start from the biological side. So I'm going to start talking about extracellular vesicles. Maybe all of you are extracellular vesicles researchers and experts. Um, then it might not be so interesting. But I didn't know since you were so many people maybe coming from different directions, I thought we should play some sort of yeah, common knowledge together. So this is why I start from the extracellular vesicle side. So. The first question that I'm raising is, why is the interest in extracellular vesicles so high? So 20 years ago, the overall opinion about extracellular vesicles was mainly that they are garbage bins for cells. But when we look here, maybe I should start my presentation mode uh, here. When we look here um, at the number of publications dealing with extracellular vesicles, Um, so the source here is the listed publications on PubMed per year. It seems that this opinion has changed a bit because I guess that research about garbage would not really explain this massive increase since the early 2000s. So to understand that increasing interest, um, we have to ask ourselves, what are EVs? Um, you know that they are, um, that they can be divided in uh, three main groups. So we have apoptotic bodies that develop during the programmed cell death by membrane bleeding, and they can then contain the degradation products. So additionally, we have microvesicles, which are formed by membrane budding. And these um, smallest EVs and the smallest EVs are exosomes, which are of endosomal origin, and they have to undergo exocytosis. And they are known to have a median size of roughly 30 to 130 nanometer only. And they can contain proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and other metabolites. So they, these exosomes came mainly into the research focus because it could be shown in many publications that they transfer biological functional molecules from their cell of origin to a recipient cell where they then regulate cell behavior. So either they start a signaling cascade by ligand binding, or they are taken up by endocytosis, 
or they fuse with the membrane. So this has um, shown that it has, it, by these ways, it has been shown that they can um, alter then the gene expression of the target cells. And in this way, they can play a pivotal role for different diseases. So especially their role in um, different cancer entities has been intensively studied. For example, they seem to play a pivotal role in metastasis but they can also be used as biomarkers or um, as therapeutic approach. And this is only cancer. So there's a long list of other diseases where the small EVs seem to be involved, like cardiovascular diseases, ne neurogenerative or respiratory diseases. And additionally, they also play a role in infectious diseases. Um, and knowing this, then it's not a surprise anymore that the interest in these small key players for different um, diseases orchestrating cellular functions in physiological and in pathological conditions is very high and it's still increasing. But so what is our challenge? So when we compare the size of an exosome with a cell, we see that they are about 100 fold smaller. They have a size of about 100 nanometer and are in a similar size range than a lot of viruses, for example. And therefore, most of the typical um, cell biological methods cannot be used to study exosomes. I myself did never work with EVs during my research career, career but I tried to analyze platelets. And the platelets are still about 10 to 50 times larger than exosomes. And I tried to characterize them um, about 10 years ago with a fax canto flow cytometer. And honestly, that was not easy. That was quite a challenge. Um, and the reason is that the conventional flow cytometers are simply built for cells and the cell size range. I know that there are a lot of attempts to analyze exosomes in conventional flow cytometers, but um, to be honest, so from um, my um, point of view, the data are a lot biased because they are, yeah, these instruments are not built for that size range. So our main challenge, if you want to characterize EVs and especially exosomes is their size. And this challenge ranges from their isolation over their enrichment up to their characterization and analysis. Um, I'm not talking about the first two steps because this is not our business, um, but I have a suggestion how to overcome the challenge regarding their characterization and analysis. So the solution I would suggest is using nanoparticle tracking instead of flow cytometry. So, with nanoparticle tracking analysis, we have a method that was developed for the size range below one micrometer. And here I have now a scheme of the inside of the blue box named ZetaView. So this is how the instrument looks like, and this is what is, what is inside it. Um, so we have on top one or more lasers, which give light to our particles of interest, which we injected into the measurement chamber. All the particles in here scatter then the light coming from the laser. In 90 degree angle, we have an objective followed by a high sensitive CMOS camera detecting the light coming from the particles. And in case we want to work with fluorescent light, we can simply use here this um, fluorescent filter, which we move in front of the camera so we can block the laser light and analyze only longer wavelengths fluorescent light. And with this setup, we can analyze the size of each particle, we can analyze their concentration, we can analyze the zeta potential, we can work in fluorescent mode, and we can do colocalization analysis. So the history of the zeta view started in 2008, when the first blue box with the name zeta view was launched. And this instrument here was uh, It will be interesting for you to hear, I guess it's a surprise, we designed this instrument not for the um, biological research field. We didn't have exosomes or EVs in mind. This instrument was designed for the paper industry. 
And we further worked on this instrument. So we launched in 2014 the first instrument, which was able to analyze size and concentration as well. And this instrument still was designed for the paper industry, but we got in touch with uh, Bernd Giebel, a German professor, maybe some of you know him. And he said, well, that's a great system because it, it's, it makes us possible to see our, um, our extracellular vesicles and to measure them. But he said it would even better for us if you could implement a fluorescent channel because we would like to do some sort of subpopulation analysis. And our R&D department um, yeah, took the challenge. And so we worked on that and launched in 2017 the first CETA view with, here you can see it, a fluorescent filter, which could then be moved in front of the camera so we could measure the particles in scatter mode where we see all particles or in fluorescent mode where we then see subpopulations. Um, with this instrument, um, we had great success in the um, yeah, extracellular vesicle research field. We sold a lot of units, um, but we still got the response, well, it would be nice if you could Im implement more fluorescent channels for deeper analysis. And so we launched in 2018 the TWIN um, with two lasers. And this is actually the model that, um, so the TWIN version, so is the version that you have in the lab in uh, Buenos Aires now. In 2019, we launched the quad with four lasers. And in um, 20, 2022, we launched a new instrument series in X30 series. And this is still available as mono twin and quad. And this is this, the instrument series that you have um, as the twin version with two lasers. And the system itself is really straightforward. So you simply inject your sample through this injection port, which is here in front. Then you directly visualize your particles since the camera is turned on all the time. And then you can um, start a measurement and get a result on your size distribution or zeta potential distribution within roughly one minute. And one of our unique features is the scanning technique. So we decided to build the laser and the microscope on movable tables. And that enables us to measure different subpopulations um, out of one sample. So um, this is, you can imagine like, like Z-Stacks, um, this is what this little video should show. So when you start one measurement, you analyze typically 11 different measurement positions. And the reason for this is simple. So we um, get a much more representative sample re result with a higher statistical power. So if you analyze one position, you typically analyze something between 50 and 200 particles. And then you got often, get often a size distribution, which is here a bit peaky. Um, but if you look on the Y scale, you see that you are just working in a range where you have just a few particles analyzed. If we analyze then 10 more positions, we normally see that our size distribution is looking like this. So you are statistically on the way safer side this way because you can analyze up to one or 2,000 particles in one, in one run easily. Okay, I told you we can measure size. With this slide, I would like to explain how we do that. <clears throat> so this is how your particle will look like in the Zeta view. We create videos. And what we see is that the particles move constantly. And this movement is called Brownian motion and it's depending on their size. So the smaller a particle is, the faster it moves. And the other way around, the, the larger it is, the more lazy it is, um, and it will not move so fast. And what the software does is just tracking the way the particles move from frame to frame. And the physical, uh, um, physical background is not our idea. Um, it's the Stokes-Einstein equation that we use. So that gives us the relationship between the radius. So we are looking at vesicles, spherical particles. So the radius is their size. Um, by analyzing the diffusion coefficient, which we can track here in the software. Of course, we need other um, parameters like viscosity, temperature, and the constant value. The temperature is measured by the Zeta view all the time. The viscosity needs to be told the instrument. As long as we work in water or water-based buffers, 
there's nothing to do. The system knows this viscosity value, but the system would be able to analyze also um, the zeta, uh, the size in, let's say, alcoholic um, uh, buffers or something. But then you need to tell the system, now this is a different viscosity. Um, and then you get you can still use the Stokes-Einstein equation and get a, a reliable result on the size. So the take-home message is not a complicated equation. I'm a biologist. I'm, I hate equations. So the take-home message is that the size is calculated by the measurement of the Brownian motion of the particles. Additionally, I told you that we can measure the concentration. How we do this is pretty easy to explain. We know the size of our field of view of the camera. We also know the thickness. So we know that we measure three nanoliter per measurement position. And then the zeta view simply counts every particle being present in this field of view. So we know the number of particles per volume. So we know the concentration. And I said we are measuring 11 um, positions. So we are measuring 11 times three nanoliters, so 33 nanoliter in, in total. That sounds to be a small volume. But if you have in mind that we are looking at the nanometer scale, and if you compare that with other methods working in this scale, you will see that it's a rather big volume and you get a really good overview about what's going on in your sample. Additionally, I said we can measure zeta potential. Um, for the zeta potential, I have an introductory slide because I'm not sure how many of you have been working with zeta potential before because it's not a very biological um, measurement parameter. Um, so the theory is whenever you have particles in solution, you have different forces working against each other. So for example, you have Van der Waals forces. Particles attract each other simply because they have a mass. That would mean um, if we have a lot of Van der Waals forces that we have agglomeration over time, um, the particles size increase, therefore we get also sedimentation and our solution is um, unstable. In contrast, we have the zeta potential. So two bodies charged the same way repel each other. And of course, the higher the potential is, the more they repel each other. So the more stable the solution is. That sounds very technical. And I agree, this is where it comes from. It comes more from things like, um, let's say, um, ink production or so, where people want to know, is my product stable the way I, I produce it? Um, or is it instable and will agglomerate? But it is also true for vesicles. So it's known that if you isolate um, extracellular vesicles, they have a typical zeta potential of minus 25 to minus 35 millivolts, roughly. And um, it's also known that if you stress your vesicles um, due to freeze and saw cycles, buffer exchanges, things like this, they tend to lose their potential. So it, it tends more to zero. And if we look at this, the, so this is an experiment that, that we did. We isolated them. They had a zeta potential of minus 25 millivolts. And after a buffer exchange, um, we found the zeta potential to be at minus 18 millivolts. So it's just seven millivolts difference. It does not seem to be such a big deal. But if we then measure the size, and this here is now a logarithmic scale, you see a dramatic increase. So they, they are not stable. They don't behave like material you want to do experiments with. There's something going on with them. And um, the advantage of measuring the zeta potential is that this is something you can measure directly after um, you thaw your stuff and you want to get prepared for a row of experiments. Then you can check the zeta potential. Because if you just measure the size, you might still find them here because this agglomeration takes time to happen. So what you can do is use the zeta potential as quality criteria for EVs. How do we measure zeta potential? That's pretty easy. We simply apply um, an electrical um, voltage to our measurement chamber, and then our particles start to move according to their surface charge. And um, that's what we can then measure. So the software, again, just tracks the way the particles move. Then we can use the helmholtz murkowski equation, which gives us the zeta potential as a function of the electrophoretic mobility, uh, which the zeta view can measure here. And here in this little video, you already see that 
most of the particles behave more or less the same way. So they will show um, a very similar zeta potential. But if you look at this particle here, it behaves completely different and will have a different zeta potential value, of course. So the take home message is again uh, quite easy. So the zeta potential is calculated by the measurement of the movements of the particles in an electrical field. Now I told you how do we measure the different parameters. Now I'm going to show you how the data look like. So I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with this kind of size histograms where we plot the number or the concentration of our particles against the diameter. But we cannot only build up these graphs, we can additionally do dot plots where we plot um, some, so two different parameters against each other. So a very typical combination is to plot the mean intensities so or the brightness of the particles against the size of the particles. There are other variables available in the system which are measured, but I'm not a physicist. Some of them are really hard for me to, to explain what they actually mean. And um, I think for biological applications, normally mean intensity against size is the interesting one. Um, and the question is then, why do we need this? I mean, we are just interested in size and concentration and maybe zeta potential. Well, it becomes of interest when you have some sort of mixtures of samples. So this here is an example of polystyrene and gold. And you see we have one size peak. So seems like both materials have a similar size. But if we look at the, this dot plot, intensity against size, then we see two well-separated populations, which makes perfectly sense. We have a very bright um, population because gold is a nearly perfect scatterer, so nearly 100% of the infalling light is scattered, and we see bright particles. In contrast, we have polystyrene, more behaving like biological material, it's absorbing um, the, the majority of the light and reflects only a portion. So they are comparably dim. And if we gate these populations, then we can now find out what is the size or the concentration of the single materials that we have in our, in our mixture. So we have several typical applications for the Zeta view. On the left side, more the um, biological ones. On the right side, more the technical ones. And now I'm going to focus on the fluorescent labeled bio nanoparticles. And the first question is always, so why fluorescence? I mean, you can measure everything in scatter mode. And this is, of course, true. We don't need uh, fluorescence to get any kind of data. But if you ask why we should uh, use fluorescence, then here, this is my example. Imagine this here is the sample that you gave me for analysis. And I'm asking you, what is this particle? And your first answer might be, well, stupid questions. It's an exosome. I isolated exosomes and gave them to you. And then I ask you, how can you be sure that this is not a salt precipitate or a protein aggregate or a nanobubble? Because they all scatter roughly the same amount of light. They all have roughly the same size. So how can you be sure? But if you can't be sure, I mean, what do you know about the data that you are presenting? But this is exactly the way how scatter-based NTA works. So you use a laser, you excite all particles in your, in your sample, no matter what kind of origin they have, and then you analyze all, all these particles. In fluorescent mode, we simply use an emission filter, which we put in front of the camera. So we block the laser light, and only the longer wavelengths fluorescent light can pass. So we can focus on our particles of interest and forget about impurities like nanobubbles. But if we want to do that, we of course need some sort of fluorescent staining. So the easiest thing that you can do is a membrane staining. There are thousands of membrane dyes available. Um, what we use in this example is uh, cell mask orange. So we stained an exosome standard sample um, with this cell mask orange dye staining all membranous particles. And here we see first in blue the size distribution in scatter mode and then the size distribution in the fluorescent mode. So we see that we find about 85% of all particles back in fluorescent mode. 
So 15% have been rubbish. And we see that our median size is changed, it's decreasing. So if we do this, we are not super specific since we stain everything that is membranous, but we are getting closer to reality. We are better than just measuring scatter mode. If we want to gain more specificity, then you normally use antibodies. So for exosome identification, that's what a lot of people want to do. Um, we can use the triple staining with CD9, CD63, CD81. Um, in this example, all labeled with Alexa Fluor 488. So we can detect all exosomes in one fluorescent channel. So here we see the same sample that I showed before already, but now analyzed in the fluorescent channel um, after staining with these antibodies. And you see now that the concentration is dropped by about 33%. And our median size is also way smaller, which makes sense because the bigger stuff in our sample is something else, but not, not the exosomes. So with our quad model, we could analyze up to four fluorescent channels. So um, we have um, here as a sample of platelet-derived EVs. No, it's not platelet-derived. Uh, where was it from? Well, oh, no, it is platelet-derived, yeah. Uh, platelet derived EVs, and we stained again with the three typical exosome markers CD9, CD63, and CD81, and additionally with CD41 as a platelet, so marker of origin for our samples. And um, we see all of them to be present in some sort of different um, percentages, which is totally normal. But um, we could now when we have a closer look on our results, we could now maybe want to um, analyze that we have about 9% CD63, um, and we could like to assume that we have 9% platelet-derived CD63 positive um, exosomes in our sample. That would mean we would have this situation here, so a parallel expression of CD63 and CD41 on the surface of the same vesicles. But we can't get that from that data because it could be like this year as well. So expression on separate molecules. We don't know it from, from this data here. And the reason for this is that in the traditional NTA systems, the measuring volume is uncompensated. So when we use a 488 and a 640 um, nanometer laser in the system, we look at slightly changed volumes, so we cannot identify the same particle in both volumes. But in the new X30 generation, we managed to align the lasers perfectly, so we are now looking in the same volume with both lasers. And here in this short video, you see now a shift between the red and the blue fluorescent channel. And now you can see that it's not a problem to identify the same particle in both fluorescent channels. And um, so we are, with, this, with, the, with these systems now, not able only to analyze the subpopulation green and the subpopulation red, we can additionally get the information about the double positive ones. And yeah, get there for the concentration of what is double positive. So how does this colocalization function work? This is what this little video shows. Um, at each measurement position, the laser changes within milliseconds between the blue and the red excitation, and the fluorescent particles in each excitation source are detected. And afterwards, the software analysis can analyze which particles appear in both colors and therefore are, are double positive. What I have to say, since we are also talking about the instrument that you have in Buenos Aires, in Buenos Aires you have a blue and a red laser, but you don't have the colocalization function, but it would be something that could, um, could be um, um, upgraded at a later time point if there is some sort of interest in it. Here I'm going to show now some data of how these, how these um, measurements look like then. So one of the first ex uh, samples that we used was liposomes, which we stained with two membrane dyes. Um, and in this video, you see now the shift between the red and the blue fluorescent channel, and the particles that are in the circles are the ones that are present in both channels and are therefore double positive. 
And we then get the size distribution of the three different channels, so scatter, fluorescence green, fluorescence red. And we can um, get additionally the information that we have a co-localization rate about 75%. So 75% of the red ones have been present in the um, green channel as well. Then just another example, um, because this example of the um, liposomes is a bit artificial. So we have also data on um, exosomes. In this case, they are endothelial derived. So we stained with um, an um, antibody directed against CD63 and CD81. So it's a mixture. Then we used a, um, a secondary antibody with a PE label. Um, and additionally, we used cell mass deep red to stain the membranes. Then we did our co-localization measurement. And again, you see here the particles in the circle that are present in both fluorescent channel. And in this case, we have a co-localization rate of about 28%. So 28% of the, of the membranous particles are indeed positive for CD63 and CD81. And of course, we are not limited to the extracellular vesicle research field. We could also do analysis on other small stuff um, in this, this is here an example now of a viral um, particle. So it's it's phage phi, which we used as a model organism. And for staining, we used cell bright. So that's also membrane staining. It's just a bit better fitting to the envelope structure of the of the virus. And we used cyber gold to stain nucleate acids. And then we did our experiment. We found um, yeah scatter mode, and in the scatter mode. From the scatter mode, we have about 47% positive for cyber gold and about 43% positive for cell bright. So we were expecting a very high co-localization rate. I mean, we see that the that the um, particles are have more or less the same concentration in both fluorescent channels. So we thought, well, every virus should have a membrane and every virus or an envelope and every virus should contain nucleic acids. But that was not the case. We only found a co-localization rate of about 58%, which was quite interesting. So it seems there are a lot of incorrect folded um, yeah, uh, virus particles in our sample. I would like to mention one last thing, and this is bleaching, because I talked so much about fluorescent now, and then I would like to mention bleaching. Because in the NTA system, it's different than, for example, fluor cytometry. It's not enough when the particle passes the laser beam. We need to follow their movement because it's nanoparticle tracking, right? So we would like to work with dyes, which are at least a bit stable. Um, in an ideal world, fluorophores would behave like the green one here. That means that they would be here stable over time, even when they're exposed to light. But this is for, unfortunately, only very few uh, fluorophores um, the case, or fluorescent molecules. Um, most of them behave like the orange one, so they bleach quite fast after they have been exposed to light. And this is not a problem for the Zeta view, because we need about 0 0.5 to 1 second excitation time. So we work in a range where we get about 95% of the signal of, of most of the fluorophores measured. But unfortunately, there are some dyes which behave here like the red one, which really bleach like, like this way too fast. Um, and we would not suggest to use them for fluorescent NTA experiments. The most prominent example here for is, is FITSI. It's widely used in flow cytometry but it's first a dim dye and it's second bleaching super fast. So please don't use this if possible. We have implemented a low bleach technique into um, the Zeta view, which helps to analyze these fluorophores too. So it's not impossible, but I mean, you can just imagine that you get better results if you stick to the ones that are a bit more stable. And of course, we can help you with the selection of dyes. So um, please get in touch if you have questions about, about these things. Yeah, that brings me to, to the end uh, of the presentation. So that's my last slide. Um, I have to thank um, a lot of collaborators who helped us with the data. We are still working in close collaboration with the Universitätsklinikum Essen, so the Bernd Giebel Group, 
um, we work together with um, Hansa Biomed, which supply us with standard EV samples. Since we have just a small lab, we are not isolating EVs by ourselves. Um, and um, yeah, some some other research partners. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any kind of questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them as good as I can. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation. And now we have 15 minutes for questions. So. OK, so we're going to open the microphones. So please, please, please keep them all shut down, shut off. And we just allow the people who want to ask questions. Gabriela, ¿me puedes dar una mano habilitando a quién había levantado? Ana Paula Domínguez. Bueno, acá mientras te van preguntando por, eh, sorry, Cristina. We have some questions in the chat. So you have some experience with EVs from urine samples? Well, um, we I know that we have customers working with that. Um, I personally haven't isolated them um, from urine. I guess that's the um, that's the challenge here. For the analysis part, it should not really matter. Um, and I'm unfortunately not a real expert for the for the isolation, and this is why I. I can't help here um, really well. Okay. We have another uh, thank you. Do you have any recommendation to avoid the background noise? Could that become an issue? Um, the question is which background noise? So are we talking about background noise in scatter mode? Um, that would mean just mainly other particles. And no, there is no not really um, a way around it. Um, the way around it would be use fluorescence to stain your particles of interest. Um, or are you talking about the background noise in the fluorescent channel? Then yes, there is a strategy ah, in scatter mode. Okay, <laughs> thank you for answering. Um, yeah, that's that's hard. I mean, the background just comes from other particles that are in the sample, and I mean. It's just a physical um, 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 thing, right? I mean, just every particle in which is in the sample scatters light. So we, we cannot um, solve that. Um, the, the question is if there would be a possibility to use another isolation method that you isolate less other particles. Um, just a few things that we know. So if you try to analyze our vesicles directly in um, media, that's possible. Um, and then um, you should avoid um, media containing um, uh, serum because that has thousands of particles and proteins. That should be avoided and you should avoid um, um, phenol red, which is in a lot of media because it also scatters light. That's what I can say. The other stuff which is coming really from particles inside, then I can just say it would be good to have an additional look on the uh, on the uh, on the isolation method if there is a maybe a better one um, where you don't co-isolate so many other stuff. Uh, okay, so we have another question. Thank you, Christina. My question is, as we cannot do colocalization analysis for now, can we make the colocalization manually with image Jota? Image Jota, sorry if I say it in Spanish. <laughs> with, with? With another software, image uh, J. Ah, uh, not really, because the problem is you cannot change so fast between the different fluorescent channels. 
um, that does not work. Um, but you, so we, what I mean is when you don't change so fast between the different fluorescent channels, you cannot say that's the same particle in both channels. And this is why also image J doesn't help. Um, so the overlay pictures does not help because the, the limiting factor is the, um, the switch of the software so fast. Um, but of course you can analyze, you have 60% whatever positive in the green and 40% in the red channel. That's what you can still do with your, with your, um, with your system. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found the talk very interesting. What happens or what do you think in relation to nanoparticles that are formed by self-assembly compared to the dilutions so important that they are required for the analysis by NTA? Thank you. Sorry, I have to ask you to repeat the question that yeah. was so long. What I didn't happens, get it completely. Yeah, you, you have it in the chat here and read it just in case anybody can, can see it. But it's what happens or what do you think in relation to nanoparticles that are formed by self-assembly compared uh -huh. to the dilutions so important that they are required for the analysis by NTA? Yeah, it's to be honest, not 100% easy to understand for me what is meant, but I, I will just give my thoughts and maybe you can comment on if mm -hmm. I'm, if this is of interest or if, if I should go into another di direction. Um, yeah, indeed, you can have uh, particles that um, just um, come up, that just form by agglomeration of smaller stuff. Um, so that brings us back again to the answer of the questions regarding the background. Um, if you can use an isolation method that gives you less, um, less co-precipitates, let, let's say, in, in, um, in your isolation, um, if yes, then you would have, of course, also less problems with that. Um, and um, then the next thing that I would always recommend, use the fluorescent mode and stain specifically your stuff, then you you are not so much affected um, by these um, other particles that might might form um, during yeah, just the storage of the sample or the preparation of the sample. Um, that would yeah, that would be my comment on that. Thank you. Um, when you count the amount of particles, you can filter setting a size or just count all the particles in the area? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, we can, we can not really um, set a size, at least not for the complete analysis. So we are analyzing everything which is in the sample, but in the software, you can afterwards um, set like gates and say, okay, I'm just interested in the in the um, concentration range between whatever 30 and 130 nanometers. So in the post analysis, you can then get information about just the size range um, that you are interested in. That's that's possible. And there is also another way. Um, but this is not about size, this is about, about the brightness of the particles. So you can, um, in the software, set a minimum and a maximum brightness um, value to exclude. The idea is normally excluding really small stuff um, and really, really big stuff. So far away from what is of interest. Um, it's like just setting, you know, really uh, wide range borders. But um, Depending on your application, you could maybe set them a bit, um, a bit more narrow, and then exclude really uh, so bigger or smaller stuff. But the problem with this is that, as I said, this this can't be due to the um, size. This is just due to the, the brightness the particles have, and of course, somehow brightness and um, and size um, are dependent from each other, but only in a in a certain amount. Because um, as we saw in this one slide, so if you have gold and polystyrene both at the same size, they scatter totally different amount of light um, based on their refractive index. That means just using this brightness um, parameter could, could bias your data. And this is why this wouldn't be my first choice. I would just analyze all data and then use in the software um, the these um, light gates to say, okay, now I want to focus on this, um, this nanometer scale. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know a technical question, which is the volume of the sample you need for measurement and can you recover the sample? Yeah, uh, good question. 
So the volume that we need minimum is 0.5 ml, but I always say you should have one ml because you have just a dead volume in your vial, in your syringe, in wherever. So please just have one milliliter in mind. That sounds to be a huge volume, but we normally dilute the sample very strong. So um, we work in a concentration range of 10 to the power of 7 or 10 to the power of 8. So for a typical EV isolation, you dilute your sample about 1,000 or at least 100 times. So that means the original uh, volume is 1 to 10 microliters, something like this. And can you recover the sample? Yes, you can. Um, it's, it's possible. You just need to decide before you inject because before you inject the sample, you can close the line to the waste, which is the normal way. We inject it and then we just wash and the sample goes to the waste. But we can close this line and then instead open a, a recovery way and then we can um, recover the sample for other analysis. To be honest, not many customers use it um, because the, it's anyhow so, so diluted the sample that you cannot use it for, let's say, Western blotting or something. But we have customers working with, um, my, that's my favorite example, um, uh, EVs and uh, isolated um, from um, Drosophila flies. They care about every single EV and they recover it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do you recommend sonicating the samples just before measuring them on the equipment? N not for EVs would be my answer. Uh, for EVs, no, I would never recommend sonication. Um, but if you analyze other material like uh, gold nanoparticles, um, also some, some pharmaceutical uh, samples, they just require sonification before um, they are measured. So the answer is it's sample dependent. Uh, do you have one more, does the instrument tend to overestimate the size of particles? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Um, if you go through literature, there's literature saying that. But if I go back on my slide um, uh, to off, uh, where, I, um, where I show the analysis in fluorescent mode by the use of the antibodies in comparison to scatter mode, I think that makes clear where this idea comes from. Because in the younger days of NTA, people just did um, scatter-based NTA, and they reported the overall size that you get as the size of the EVs. And this is then way larger, uh, so typically around 130, 140 nanometers, in comparison to, um, to what comes out in, let's say, a TEM analysis, where EVs were more shown to have a size of, let's say, 80 nanometers. So people thought, okay, NTA is always overestimating the size. But the real reason for this is that in scatter mode, we analyze way more than just the EVs. We analyze bigger stuff too. So if you really focus on the EVs by the use of a good staining, an antibody staining, you normally get sizes that are in more or less perfect, um, uh, perfect, uh, um, yeah, giving the same results like ten analysis, ten analysis. So I don't think that it in generally um, overestimates the size. Um, I think that's um, really dependent on what you analyze. If we look at standard material, um, we I mean we use um, for for calibration of the machine um, 100 nanometer polystyrene beads. We get exactly that size that is um, giving by the um, yeah, producers of this uh, standard material. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a is there a particular brand of antibody that is recommended for this kit? And another question: Have you used samples bound to fluorescently label DNA aptamers? Huh, great question. There's somebody deep into topic. Um, no, there's not a specific a particular brand uh, that we recommend. You can use any, any, any antibody you want. Of course, we have tested some. We can tell you some, at least for the for these um, tetraspendins that we know that work quite well. But in general, you no. Know, um, whatever you want to use is fine. Um, Aptamers, we are working on that. So um, because, of course, we, we, we would think that it would be an advantage to use Aptamers. They are just smaller. 
Um, but I, I'm not in the application team. I just know that my colleague is working on that, but I don't know what kind of results he has so far. So that's a good question, but I, I cannot, um, yeah, I, I don't have details on, on what they found out so far. Okay. Um, tomorrow. Uh, thank you for the talk. Is it possible to identify the auto organization of dyes? The quantity of contamination of a sample because of this auto aggregation, um, self aggregation. Aggregation of dyes. Yes, um, that's less a problem with antibodies. That's more a problem with, let's say, membrane dyes. It's known that they form um, aggregates, and yeah, you should definitely always use a um, control to check that. Um, and the since since January we have um, new MySAF guidelines. Um, I guess you have seen them, and they exactly say that you should always use a control where you just use your dye um, without the vesicles in a sample, and then analyze that. And that should of course then show that you don't have agglomerates inside. And if you don't have them in there, you you wouldn't expect them to be in your sample. Um, for from my experience. Um, you always have a few, um, but it's just, let's say, two or three or whatever. And then when you see that in your sample is way more, I mean, that's just like a little bit of background. Um, and if you show the controls to your analysis, that should be fine. Great. And the last one, and we have to pass to the second part of this webinar, is which is the difference between NTA and DLS for size measurement of or inorganic NPs? Yeah, a uh, good question. Um, well, um, DLS is the difference, the main difference between NTA and DLS is that NTA is a technique to follow every single particle. So it's a single and a single particle analysis technique, while DLS is measuring the signal of all particles in one sample. Um, and this um, is, so if you have if you have particles that are all at the same size, um, then DLS is a great um, technique. The advantage of it is that you can go way lower. So our size limit is depending on the material, somewhere between uh, for biological material 30, 40 nanometers to a gold about 10 nanometers. Um, DLS can go way smaller um, depending on the, the system that you're using, maybe just two nanometers or so. So if you're really analyzing small stuff, um, and they are all at the same size, go for DLS. But if you have a sample which is, um, which is where you have different, different sizes inside, um, DLS is very biased because the, the signal of bigger particles, the light signal is way larger than the signal coming from the small particles. And then the DLS system completely overestimates uh, the larger particles and does more or less overlook the small ones. So um, that means it just depends on what kind of sample you have, what technique is the right one to go with. In concentration is the next thing. For DLS, you need a rather high concentration to get a good reading. And for NTA, um, you, you, you use a way lower concentration. So it depends on what, what sample do you have. Um, is it do you have only particles at one size or or not um and what is the concentration um and then you can decide what what technique is the better one for your sample okay yeah. so uh thank you and uh, well just one comment about another question i clarify the previous question could the dilution used in nta disassemble particles disassemble so you mean if you, I guess I understand what what you mean, that if you dilute, um, that it changes the particle parameters, I guess. And then the answer is yes, I've seen that. Um, so it's that's not a problem for vesicles, and it's not a problem um, if you um, if you have a stable solution. But I have seen samples where you destabilize the solution by, by a dilution, and then you see that something is going on. Um, you can get an idea about this by measuring the zeta potential, by measuring after different um, time frames. But yeah, it, it, if you have a way higher concentration in the original sample and you need to dilute, 
whatever, I've seen 100,000 times um, and um, the solution gets instable, yes, it can happen. Well, thank you very much, very much, Christina, for, for your presentation and for the time to answer all these questions. So now we are going to, to, to present the second part of this webinar in Spanish. So see you, see you soon, Hope. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, enjoy the second part of the seminar, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.